Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, greetings from Liverpool, the city of Beatles. Thank you, Amit and uh, Satendra, for inviting me for this uh, MPISA WebCon 2021, uh, which is your 35th annual conference of ME MP chapter of the ISA. So I've been asked to talk about managing perioperative pain, how we predict it and how we manage postoperative pain. Uh, my name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh. I'm a consultant in anesthesia. I work at the Royal Liverpool University Hospitals, which is part of Liverpool University Hospital Foundation Trust. So what is the ultimate goal in anesthesia and how do we achieve it? That's a big question. And I'll come to the answer later on part of the talk. We're going to use these two acronyms. We're going to arrest the pain as anesthetist. That's uh, one of our jobs. And we're going to be smart. Anesthetists are always thought to be smart people. They're clever people. When you're called for an emergency, okay, there'll be a lot of people surrounding the patient. The moment the anesthetists arrive, everybody disappears. You are the Superman of the A&E or for the hospital. So we work smart as well. So the first part of uh, arrest or arresting is assessing. Yes, assessing and predicting pain. So we're talking about predicting post-operative pain. It's about recognizing who is at greater risk of severe moderate to severe post-operative pain. So why, why do we need to predict that who is going to be in moderate to severe post-operative pain? Why not just give uh, morphine or fentanyl or tramadol to everyone anyway? So it has been seen that post-operative pain still remain untreated undertreated, so not untreated, undertreated in almost 80 to 85% of the patients. These patients with the wake of a moderate to severe pain in the post-operative period. This was seen in 2003 and 2014 and later on as well. So if the patient wake up with a severe, moderate to severe post-operative pain and remain in pain, it is, leads to poor outcomes, which uh, translates into increasing length of stay. It causes sleep, uh, sleep disturbances because patient can't sleep with pain. It stops them from mobilizing. Okay, that might be because of the pain itself, or it may be because you have used more opioids to treat pain. It can also lead to delirium in the elderly because you're usually going to use uh, more opioids or try to calm them down. And if you don't treat this post-operative pain adequately, it can progress to uh, persistent post-surgical pain, or it can also progress to chronic pain syndromes. Not treating pain appropriately is associated with cardiopulmonary and thromboembolic complications as well. Some of them may be related to pain itself and others may be related to the way you treat the pain with opioids. So what's the solution? Solution lies in understanding the preoperative pain predictors so that we can anticipate pain and we can individualize the pain treatment for these patients. Some patients are going to require greater amount of painkillers than others. So what are the predictors of poor post-operative pain control? So we're going to look at the various factors. And the first of them is looking at the sex or the gender. And it has been seen that females tend to feel 30% more pain than their counterparts. That translates into 11% more use of opiates in females than in males. So females are more prone to severe, moderate to severe post-operative pain. Then comes the age. So how is age related to pain? It has been seen that patients 
who are more than 50 years of age, that every decade, that is every 10 years, the pain reduces by 30% or the, or the, the requirement for post-op pain relief reduces by almost uh, 30% as you become older. So the younger patients are more prone to severe post-operative pain. Smoking, smoking has been related to increased requirement for post-op pain relief. And then comes depression and anxiety. This is very important because this is a common factors in patients requiring more post-operative pain relief, but also in progression of the post-operative pain to persistent post-surgical pain and then to chronic pain. Whether depression is self-reported or it is diagnosed by a psychiatrist, it doesn't matter. Even mild to moderate depression or anxiety is associated with requirement for higher pain relief, greater pain relief in the post-operative period. Then preoperative analgesia use. This may be related to poor post-operative pain control. That is the patient already has a greater severity of pain even before the surgery. It may be related to opioid induced hyperalgesia. And to central and peripheral sensitization of the pre-existing uh, nociception. So these patients are going to require uh, greater you know, pain relief than their counterparts who do not use opioids or other energies here in before the surgery. Obesity is mildly linked to increase. It is not a great one to include in the predictors, but sleep difficulty has been but this may be indirectly related to presence of anxiety and depression. We know that patients who have anxiety and depression don't have good sleep at night. So these patients also require greater amount of pain relief in the post-operative period. So all this has been studied by multiple authors. So there's a whole list of these uh, papers which have been used to synthesize the results and create a simple uh, kind of scoring system so it was a meta-analysis and that looked at more than 50,000 patients. And then they put up this uh, forest graph and you can actually see uh, the raw, uh, raw ratios. So anything which is more than one is actually important that affects the outcomes. So if you look at uh, the younger age, which was seen in uh, 14 studies and females in 20 studies, you can see that the all ratio is more than one. That means it is a significant factor which affects the outcomes. So is smoking, history of depression, history of anxiety, sleep difficulties, you know, they rank highly. Okay, presence of preoperative pain and preoperative analgesia use rank highly. Whereas BMI is more near to one, so that's why it's not a very important factor, but still can be considered. So how has... Uh, severe post-operative pain when defined uh, for study purposes. So worse pain since surgery where the NRS scores are more than or equal to seven points is considered as severe post-operative pain. So the simple uh, risk score system uh, for predicting these uh, you know, severe post-operative pain uh, consists of obviously if the patient is female or not. So if the patient is female, then again one point. If the patient has persistent pain of NRS intensity of over three, so even mild to moderate pain, you get one point. If the patient is using opioids before admission, you get a one point. Now look at the age. Now, if you're less than 30 years, you get two points. So if you're a female in less than 30 years, you already have three points. Patients for 30 to 49 get one point. Uh, 50 to 70 is zero points and more than 70 minus one point. So we go, elderly patients tend to actually have less amount of severe post-operative pain. Now, not treating the post-op pain appropriately or letting it persist can lead to persistent post-op surgical pain, PPSP which can then progress to chronic pain. So when you have acute injury, there is, uh, sorry, you have uh, you know, tissue injury, which is you know, surgical or anyway, 
Uh, the acute pain, which is associated with this, usually resolve because of the healing process. Now, healing process will take around seven to 14 days at the most, but it can take as long as three months in certain conditions. So anything which is, uh, you know, between two weeks to around three months, uh, it could be persistent post-surgical pain. But if the pain persists beyond th three months, that is a definition of the chronic, chronic pain. In UK cross-sectional study, observational studies, which was uh, uh, in a report in 2016, uh, they looked at the post-op pain in the first 24 hours and 11% reported severe pain. Now this is later on. So I had talked about the study in 2003 and 2014. Now this is 2016. And 37% reported moderate uh, uh, pain. Okay, so 11 reported severe pain, 37 reported moderate pain. So we are slightly better off. Then there was PQ study that the perioperative quality improvement program. Uh, uh, the report came out in 2017, uh, included 2017 to 2018, and then 2018 to 2019 data. And this data was collected from 79 UK hospitals. And they looked at, again, uh, surgical site pain in the first 24 hours. And this also showed that moderate pain was seen in 48% of the patient and 19% of the patient actually like, suffered from severe post-operative pain. Now that's not good. This is despite all the advances in pain management, understanding how pain can be treated. Now this is not only in UK, a German prospective cohort study, uh, which was published in 2013 in anesthesiology compared 179 surgical procedures and more than 50,000 patients. And their results showed that 47.2% experienced severe pain. This is an RS score of about more than eight or nearly eight in the first 24 hours after surgery. This obviously was uh, variable depending on the type of surgery performed. But what is important to know that these, all these hospitals actually had acute pain services, inpatient acute pain services. So despite having the acute pain services, the patients are still suffering from uh, moderate to severe post-operative pain. So what are the concerns with poor pain control? I've already talked about uh, the outcomes. So the most important thing is that the pain should not progress to chronic or persistent post-surgical pain because this is associated with the long-term psychological, social, economical adversities. And optimum pain control is a, is a you know, it, it is a humanitarian thing. Everybody should actually have good pain control. And it's also important for delivery of efficient health services. So if the patient actually have pain, uh, they will stay longer in the hospital. Uh, they will need opioids. There will be associated complications, nausea, vomiting, constipation, drowsiness. Okay, so cardiorespiratory complications will increase, thromboembolic complications will increase because they will remain in bed, they're not able to mobilize. Okay, so they are actually concerns with poor pain control. So this is a statement I'm making that post-operative pain management should be a priority for everyone. It should be core part of patient care and outcomes. That is that it is a very essential aspect of patient care. And it's also important that the pain management is individualized. Not everybody requires the same amount of pain care. Some will require less, others will require more. And that's what I've discussed in how you predict pain. If you give too much morphine to elderly, you're gonna have more complications. Whereas if you give less amount of morphine or the same amount of morphine to a young patient who is in his twenties, he will still continue to have pain. So it is in the top five national improvement opportunity to influence care of surgical patients, that is individualizing pain management, having a specific pathways or having various multimodal analgesia pathways for specific surgeries, a part of national improvement opportunities. So coming back to the first question I asked, what is the ultimate goal in anesthesia? The ultimate goal in anesthesia is about dreaming, okay, having a good sleep and be able to wake up smiling and saying cheers. Okay, cheers here actually 
is about uh, carbohydrates. So there are certain things we need to achieve in the pre-op. You should, uh, patients should not feel hungry, so they should have carbohydrate load. This is part of the early recovery for after surgery, the ERAS protocols. They should be hydrated, they should not be thirsty. So patients should be allowed to drink water till at least two hours before the surgery. These two things will ensure the patient is eulemic. That is the patient has right amount of fluid. This will also ensure that patient is unitremic, that is sodium levels are within the normal range. Once this is, uh, this is done, they're ready to start dreaming. Okay, so they go to the theaters. Obviously there is a lot more here to that. But once they wake up, if you uh, apply this uh, protocols, the ERAS protocols, the various multimodal analgesia protocols, then patients should be able to drink as soon as possible. They should be start eating and drinking, and they should be able to mobilize as soon as possible. So that is the dreaming. So DR is for drink, EA is for eating, MING is for mobilizing. So these are the, you know, the outcomes we look at. Are the people able to do that? Certain patients are going to be really unhappy. Uh, with the kind of care they might be provided. So what are these uh, things which makes patient unhappy? So first of them is awareness under anesthesia. Okay. So we're not actually discussing awareness, but appropriate level of anesthesia need to maintain for all patients, especially if they're under general anesthesia. This is what we are talking about, that patients should not wake up with moderate to severe post-operative pain. Some patients will, wake up with some pain, but you should be able to actually manage that appropriately. Patients should not feel sick. So you should give the uh, you know, anti-emetics intraoperatively. You should be able to actually score them for post op nausea and vomiting using Apple score. Okay, so history taking is very, very important. And then also write up for post-op uh, anti-emetics. Especially if the patients are going to wake up pain, you will actually end up using opioids. And that means that if you use opioids, even a single dose increases the risk of post op nausea by almost 33% in patients. So you need to actually prescribe them antiemetics. So how are we going to achieve our goals? We're going to achieve our goals by being smart. So what is the smart? So I'm going to talk to you about, go through this uh, smart thing. So first thing in smart is about structured approach. It's about, pre-assessment and planning, okay. So the optimal pain management starts even before the patient actually goes under the knife, that is before the surgery. So this need to starts in the pre-op assessment. The pre-op assessment should include a column for, or section for pain management. Where you're gonna actually discuss with the patient uh, you know, what kind of uh, pain relief are you going to provide? Are you going to give an epidural? Are you going to give a spinal opiate? So are you going to do blocks? Or if the patient is not ready for that, are you going to plan for a PCA morphine or oxycodone? You can also educate them about taking their painkillers regularly in the post-operative period. You talk about their expectations. What do you think? What kind of pain they are expecting after surgery? Are they expecting lots of pain after surgery, or you know, are they they think that the pain will be controlled well? Uh, when do they expect to go home? And then comes delivery of care. Who is going to deliver this care? And has it been communicated to them? What are the requirements for that specific patient? So there is need to be a structure to how uh, the pain management is done very operatively. So that is the first of the SMART. Then comes the multimodal analgesia, MMA. So there is no single perfect analgesic drug. It's no magic bullet that you give one drug painkiller to the patient and you think you have sorted out everything. No. So multimodal analgesia not only requires pharmacological interventions of so various agents we'll talk about in a minute. It also requires use of regional anesthesia technique, whether it's a centrineural axis, like the epidural, spinal opioids, or continuous catheters. It also involves psychological preparation of the patient. 
are knowing their expectations and preparing them through the journey they're going to go through from the time they come to the hospital till they are discharged from the hospital. You need to have the idea about the surgery, okay, how much tissue damage the surgery is going to cause the patient. Certain surgeries are associated with more pain than a superficial surgery. For example, if you're having a thoracic surgery, the rib resection, they pain like hell. Okay. Whereas if the patient is coming for a lipoma excision, now that's not going to be very painful. Then again, there are certain surgeries which are associated with persistent post-op surgical pain and progressing to chronic pain. Now, mastectomies, hernias, amputations, these patients need to be treated slightly different to someone who is just coming uh, for a lipoma excision. You need to assess and reassess pain. So you get a patient, you actually have given them morphine, you need to come back and see how the morphine has affected the pain. Has the pain scores come down or not? You tend to continue to assess and reassess till you reach your target of low VAS or NRS. The patient should say the pain is no worse than mild pain. Okay, that means almost, almost near to scale of one to two or even zero for that matter. You do not let the patient go to the ward with moderate to severe pain. You need to target that pain control. And that's why it is important to assess and reassess pain and treat it appropriately. And that's where uh, the SMART comes in. So it's structured approach, multimodal analogies here, reassess the pain again and again and target to a low VAS or NRS scale. Now we're gonna go through some pharmacological agents which we use in multimodal analgesia. here. They should be part of your armamentarium. I'm not going to talk about opioids. Everybody has their own favorite opioids. Some like fentanyl, some like morphine, some like tramadol, some like, you know, there is whole range of opioids. We're not talking of opioids. Rather, ERAS protocol likely aim towards using as less opioids as possible as part of multimodal analgesia. It's also important to understand the pain pathway, the ascending pathway and the descending pathway. So the ascending pathway consists of transmission of pain, modulation of pain and the perception at the higher centers. So that's your ascending pathway. We have A beta fibers, A delta fibers, C fibers, and then we actually have the gating mechanism in the dorsal horn. And that's where the descending pathway comes in. So descending pathway can actually affect the way you perceive pain. So the higher centers actually affect the modulation of pain at the dorsal horn level. So modulation occurs via the descending pathway. So when you're looking at pain management, you want to actually facilitate descending pathway, whereas you want to inhibit the ascending pathway. So multimodal analgesia looks at using various agents along this pathway. Locally at the peripheral nociceptors, we can use local anesthetic infiltration on nerve blocks. We can use anti-inflammatory agents like COX-2 inhibitors. So we can use uh, uh, you know, uh, dexamethasone as well, which is also anti-inflammatory. Paracetamol can also help in pain relief at the peripheral level. Then at the sensory fiber levels, before the, uh, it reaches the dorsal horn, we can use local anesthetic via peripheral nerve blocks or catheters. At the spinal level, you can use local anesthetic along with opioids or alpha-2 agonists, NMDA antagonists, COX-2 inhibitors. And then centrally, we can actually look at the opioids. So they work at the higher centers. Then look at alpha-2 agonists. So we have central effector or alpha-2 alpha agonists like your clonidine and dexamethamidine, paracetamol, okay, it's metabolite, uh, the anandamide actually work at the central level. Then you have NMDA receptor antagonist, ketamine, magnesium sulfate. Then of course we have our general anesthesia itself. Okay. Paracetamol, everybody knows, one gram of paracetamol 
Uh, if given at the end of the surgery, 20 minutes is known to reduce the morphine requirement in the first 24 hours. The numbers needed to treat if it is used on its own is 3.6. So lower the NNT, the better it is, that is more effective it is. So the paracetamol becomes a lot more effective if it is combined with 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, 400 milligrams given every eight hourly. So the NNT comes down to 1.5. If you actually combine with codeine, 60 milligrams, NNT is 2.2. That's because certain patients do not convert codeine to morphine. So there is a pharmacogenetical uh, you know, reason for that. And then if you use it with 10 milligrams of oxycodone, it is reduced to, NNT is reduced to 1.8. So it com uh, paracetamol combined, so you, you can actually combine with ibuprofen and codeine and oxycodone, all three, then you can see that how effective it is going to be uh, for treating pain. Anti-inflammatory drugs, steroids and non-steroids are equally important part of the multimodal analgesia. here. Uh, but you need to be careful that there are side effects uh, associated with the use of non-steroids, like uh, acute kidney injury, so patients who have deranged renal function, you're not going to use it. Elderly patient dry, who are especially dry, you're not going to use it. The colorectal surgeons are worried about the anastomotic leaks with the use of uh, the non-steroidals. There is considered to be increased thromboembolic events and worsening of uh, cardiac failure. This has been seen with COX-2 inhibitors, but that is with long-term use. And uh, dexamethasone can cause hyperglycemia. So it, especially in insulin-dependent diabetic uh, patients, it can cause hyperglycemia. So anti-inflammatory are still very good as combined with uh, paracetamol provide good pain relief. And we tend to use dexamethasone four to eight milligrams at induction. And uh, it not only helps as anti-inflammatory, but it also helps in prevention of nausea and vomiting. Diclofenac, if you're using, uh, make sure that you actually dilute it into 20, at least minimum of 20 ml, if not 100 ml. Uh, otherwise, it causes three with thrombophlebitis and pain on injection. Now, ketamine. This is a little controversial. Uh, ketamine has been seen to inhibit the ascending pathway and facilitate descending pathway. So, a very good agent then. But a lot of studies actually say that there are too many side effects of the ketamine, but then the dose used is actually very high. The dose reported in this study is one to five milligram per kg body weight. So that's very high dose. We tend to actually use ketamine at much lower doses. Now ketamine has got its peripheral actions. It targets NMD receptors on the peripheral afferent neurons and thus blocks the nociceptive inputs uh, going into the spinal cord. So that's what we want. That's part of the inhibiting the descending pathway. But at slightly higher doses, it also blocks the NMD receptors in the pyramidal neurons, which are present in the brain and uh, the higher centers. And if you give higher doses, it will cause sleep because it inactivates the arousal pathways. You have the patients who actually are sleepy. So they have dissociative anesthesia, as you all know. They have eyes open, but they don't perceive anything. So ketamine, if you want to use as a part of multimodal analgesia, this is very important also in patients who are on high dose of opioids or who are drug abusers. In those patients, use bolus of just 0.3 to 0.5 milligram per kg and follow it with an infusion of 0.1 to 0.5 milligram per kg per hour. So it is not one to five milligrams, it is 0.1 to 0.5 milligram per kg per hour. In our setup, we use a doses of around 0 0.25 to 0.3 milligram per kg per hour of infusion. And you can stop this infusion at the end of the surgery. And the effect of this persists for at least 24 to 48 hours. Now, gabapentinoids, uh, there have been few meta-analyses in uh, which they have said that gabapentinoids are not good. They are not part of, should not be part of acute pain management. Well, gabapentinoids actually act on both ascending and descending pathways. So they influence both the nociceptive and affective pathways. So they should be good. But then gabapentinoids, uh, if used in higher doses, are, are associated with sedation and poor outcomes, and especially in the elderly. But then recently, just last week, 
Uh, this has come from uh, the uh, Howard University uh, from BDIMC. Uh, this was published uh, last week and they actually looked at a large uh, group of patients over quite a few years. Uh, and they said that reduced the uh, use of uh, moderate low to moderate dose of gabapentin and pre gabapentin prior to surgery is associated with decreased 30 day hospital readmissions. And I think this is because it reduces the requirement for intraoperative opioids. So when we're talking about the gabapentin and pregabalin in low to moderate dose, we are talking about just 300 to 600 milligrams of gabapentin orally or pregabalin of 75 to 150 milligrams orally. So don't go to the doses that is used by chronic pain. You're looking at three grams of gabapentin. That's too big a dose, even I want to do three grams is a huge dose. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about a, mild, a moderate uh, kind of doses, you know, small to moderate size doses. Then comes the alpha-2 agonist. Now, clonidine and dexmedomidine, uh, they uh, can be used orally. Orally is clonidine only, or clonidine oral tablets are available. There's no oral dexmedomidine. They can be given IV as bolus and infusion. They can be added to local anesthetics perineurally or also administered intrathecally with a very good effects. But there are side effects associated with alpha 2 agonists. They can cause hypertension, they can cause bradycardia, they can cause sedation. But using low dose or alpha 2 agonists as part of multimodal analgesia are actually much useful. In UK, we do not have much experience with dexmedomidine, but clonidine has been used. It's not a in a selective alpha-2 agonist, it's got both alpha-1 and alpha-2 effects. And using them just, I use a bolus of 30 to 50 microgram uh, mixed with paracetamol and give it slowly. Uh, and it keeps uh, the patient nice and stable. And also in patients who are non-hypertensive, it helps to maintain the blood pressure in them. Magnesium sulfate, uh, one of my favorites. Okay, so again, uh, the dose is 30 to 50 milligram per kg. It needs to be given uh, in a bag of fluid. So I tend to actually just mix it into a liter bag of the IV fluids I gave. Now we all know that both uh, the uh, ketamine and uh, magnesium sulfate uh, both actually act at the NMD receptor. So they are, these are NMD receptor blockers. So very good part of the multimodal analgesia. here. You again have to be careful with magnesium. Uh, magnesium uh, in higher doses uh, can cause hypotension, uh, but again, it is a cell membrane stabilizer, helps you in bronchodilation. It helps in uh, the patients who have arrhythmias, so it stabilizes the heart. So it's a very good agent otherwise. Then other agent which have been uh, used extensively is lignocaine. Now you need to be careful if I've actually had given blocks, then there's no point in giving lignocaine because you can exceed the toxic limit of the local anesthetic. But the only place where uh, lignocaine has been now allowed or lignocaine has been allowed as part of the ERAS is in colorectal surgery, nowhere else. Even the people are still using for other surgeries. So how it is used in colorectal surgery, we're assuming that they do not be using any other blocks. Then we give a bolus of one milligram per kg. Then intraoperatively run it at 40 microgram per kg per minute. And then towards the end of the surgery, you reduce it to 0 0.1 to one milligram per minute, not per kg per minute. It is 0.5 to one milligram per minute or 60 milligrams per hour. Now this dose is continued into the first post-operative day, into the post-op critical care unit. And once the patient is allowed to eat, you introduce with them with the uh, salicoxib, which is the, uh, your COX-2 inhibitor uh, and with oral oxycodone and other oral medications if they are allowed orally. And you continue the, this till the second post-op day. So you stop it on second post-op day. So the dose which need to be continued as infusion, which starts at the end of surgery, and it finishes at the end of day, post-op day one, that is before the post-op day two, is 60 milligrams per hour, or 0 0.5 to one milligram per kg. Sorry, 0 0.5 to one milligram per minute.
Now, regional anesthesia, I'm not going to discuss this in details. Uh, it can be sent in your axial. So now there has been moved from using epidurals in, in big surgeries, uh, like thoracic or uh, abdominal surgeries. It is associated with hypotension, greater use of fluids, then causing edema, a patient being tied to the bed. Uh, so that's been, but intrathecal opiates are still used. Uh, we tend to use uh, dimorphine. There are places we using morphine and other additives that are still used as part of the multimodal analgesia. Abdominal blocks are very common, whether they're single shot or catheters inserted uh, you know, in rectal sheath by surgeons or by anesthetist. Then neural blocks like rectospinal blocks are becoming more popular. And peripheral nerve blocks uh, can be used as part of the multimodal analgesia or they can be used as a, you know, as a anesthesia of their own. And when you actually send the patient to the recovery, don't forget uh, post of nausea and vomiting. So uh, treatment of pain with opioid is often associated with uh, post of nausea and vomiting. And it's very, very important. Like I said, the three things of the three things uh, which patients don't like, post of nausea and vomiting is one of them. So, you know, always have something prescribed uh, for both post of nausea and vomiting and pain. Post op instruction, whether patient has been discharged home or to the ward, are equally important. Now, WHA says that for the post op management of pain, we should actually try and uh, that the preferred method of delivering pain relief is one, by the mouth, and second, it need to be by the clock. Okay, not on demand, it need to be by the clock. And for that, it's easy that you can give paracetamol orally, you can use ibuprofen or non-steroidals orally. And there are fixed uh, dose multimodal combination available. So you have got uh, paracetamol with tramadol, uh, tramacet, um, and there are paracetamol with ibuprofen available. So fixed dose uh, combinations, multimodal, uh, good part of multimodal analgesia for post-op uh, pain management. If you are prescribing non-steroids to the patient, uh, please don't forget to prescribe some PPIs for them. I would actually suggest uh, that, especially patients who are prone to upper GI or acute kidney injuries, uh, patients that make sure that uh, they are told that they keep themselves hydrated, well hydrated, and prescribe some uh, lansoprazole, omeprazole for them. So coming to the end of the uh, lecture, I'm going to now summarize. And so early identification of predictors of uh, poor post-operative pain is very important because this helps in uh, better management, pain management. It helps us to individualize uh, our pain management or the intervention we're going to use. And by doing so, we will reduce the reliance on pain medication, especially the opioids, which is important part of the ERAS. Okay. We want patient to lose, use less and less of opioids. There is a need for increased awareness of these predictors, not only uh, among others, but also among anesthetists as well, because this will help us in developing a personalized, uh, discipline-specific uh, clinical care pathway. That is, what should be the multimodal analgesia for specific kind of surgeries? This will also help in the enhanced recovery after surgery programs. And if we have better pain management programs, it can reduce the length of stay uh, for the patients and better outcomes, of course. And improving the post-operative pain outcomes are associated with decreased perioperative uh, complications, medical complications or cardiorespiratory complications are reduced or thromboembolic complications are reduced. So it reduces the burden on the uh, healthcare system. And adequate uh, pain management uh, also helps in patient achieving dreaming, that is they are able to drink and eat early and they are able to mobilize early. So once you do that, better hydration, better calories in, mobilizing that reduces the cardiorespiratory and thromboembolic complications. And for multimodal analgesia is the mantra and we need to know the doses and we need to know the side effects 
And how to use those combinations? When do you want to actually give the particular uh, group of drugs or how do you use it? That obviously is based on patient's risk factors. If the patient is a high risk for developing post-operative pain, then you would want to introduce say ketamine uh, into the or multimodal analgesia, you would ensure the patient actually gets some kind of block. Even if you're not able to give a block, make sure the patient actually has the local infiltration. So regional anesthesia is an important aspect of multimodal analgesia. And in the end, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. And I'm going to take questions uh, from you. Uh, and I'll be ready to answer any, any questions uh, you pose at me. Thank you.